This is TTT Live. I'm DK Rostar. The Ministry of Health is giving an update on the status of COVID-19 in Trinidad and Tobago. We're bringing you live coverage on TTT, Talk City 91.1 FM, and on Facebook at TTT Live Online. We go now to Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago, and welcome to the Ministry of Health's virtual media conference on the National COVID-19 Response for Wednesday, 21st July, 2021. I am pleased to welcome back uh, today to today's panel, the Honorable Terence Dialsing, Minister of Health, Dr. Miriam Richards, Medical Officer Institutions, and Mr. Ronald Sawyerfat, Chief Executive Officer of the ERHA. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer at the Ministry of Health. We begin today with Dr. Richards, who will present the clinical vaccination and hospital occupancy updates. Dr. Richards. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning, Honorable Minister. Good morning to CEO, Mr. Soyafat. Good morning to members of the media. Thank you once again for your continued presence and attendance at these media conferences. Good morning, Trinidad and Tobago, and to all those who have tuned in on the various forms of media. This morning, I would like to provide a status update on the parallel healthcare system with specific reference to the hospitals and also yesterday's clinical update uh, number 798 as of 4 p.m. on the 27th of July 2021. At present, there were 108 confirmed positive cases over the period July 23rd to July 26th. This takes the total number of active cases to 5,789, which are distributed as follows. 5,277 cases in home isolation, 88 patients in step-down facilities, and 316 patients in hospital. There are now, at present, 1,048 deaths, and we extend our sincere condolences to the relatives of these persons. As of 4 p.m. yesterday, the total number of persons that have been vaccinated with a first dose was 357,332, with 185,020 persons vaccinated with a second dose. The Honorable Minister will provide further details on the status of vaccinations in Trinidad and Tobago. I'll now provide a summary of the information on the 16 facilities in the parallel healthcare system. At present, the total facilities, the total occupancy in the facilities is at 39%. And we've noticed this trend from on or around July 15th, where we have been under 40%. The percentage um, occupancy in our wards between Trinidad and Tobago is at 37 percent, another consistent trend. And with ICU, um, the, the trend is at 78 percent occupancy, with HDU today at 32 percent. Now, it's important to note that also we have seen a consistent decline in the occupancy levels, which rarely represent the capacity or the ability of the parallel healthcare system to respond, it has been extremely slow. At present, across our 16 facilities, two of our nine, two of our 16 facilities are above the critical threshold of 75%, with one hospital of nine above 75% and one step down facility out of seven. Um, what I'd like to note as well is that the ratio or the distribution of severely and critically ill patients as compared to those recovering continues to be skewed with a higher percentage or higher number of critically ill patients. This morning, there are 398 patients across 16 facilities with 308 at the hospitals and 98 at step-down facilities. Now, I'd like to remind members of the public that at present, the current positivity rate has increased. And as of week 30, which would be this week, the positivity rate is at 33%. Now, this was previously at 
So we are asking members of the population to not be lulled into complacency and a feeling of complacency because you are seeing a slow and steady decline in the hospital occupancies. If we continue along this trend with an increasing rolling average, that is the average number of cases per day, um, and we've noticed this between July 10th and 26th, we will have a projected positive number of cases in the low 300s by August 31st. In order to curb this trend, we are asking all members of the population to please exercise social and personal responsibility. That is, let's wear our masks, watch our distance, and let's wash our hands. Let's continue with our high vaccine acceptance rate and let's ensure that we get our second vaccine within the relevant time. Thank you very much and I pass you back on to Al. And thank you, Dr. Richards. We are pleased to welcome back Mr. Ronald Soyafat, CEO of the Eastern Regional Health Authority, as he provides an update on the work being done throughout his region especially as it relates to improving and encouraging vaccination uptake. Mr. Sarafat. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Minister and um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Richards. Uh, good morning to uh, Trinidad and Tobago. And of course, good morning, Team Healthcare uh, TNT and Team Healthcare ERHA in particular. It's my pleasure this morning to give a little update as to what is happening in the Eastern RHA and what we're doing and letting the population know. Uh, just an overview, as usual, the ERHA is one of five regional health authorities in TNT, uh, perhaps the largest geographically, but the smallest in terms of our population. Uh, our vision in the, the ERHA for vaccinate TNT is really to, to see the ERHA become uh, or achieve herd immunity. Uh, that's in terms of our community vision. Why? Because we want to say that, you know, the population is looking forward to going back to the beach and so on. And uh, the ERHA with herd immunity can become uh, a low risk place to attract our people back, you know, to being safe and, and, and that type of thing. So we're looking forward to herd immunity. We're looking forward to national immunity, herd immunity also, where we in the ERHA can go out and come back in, where the population can return to some level of normalcy and some inter-bubble interaction, I, I should say. So that what are we doing? We started off with, well, we have both national as well as community efforts in our strategy. And we started off at, at a national level, um, I should say with a, at a community level, uh, with our vaccination phase one, where we had staff, frontline and essential workers, uh, and the vulnerable population, that's the over 65, and the chronic disease clients and so on. All of this was being done at our uh, local facilities, the five local facilities. We went on after that to national level, which was uh, the mass vac sites, mass vaccination sites, where we were, we were handling defined groups at these mass vaccination, mass vaccination sites. We now enter phase three, where we're looking and concentrating on our community and local population. The general population, I just want to indicate, we are vaccinating all above 18 non-pregnant uh, persons and eligible persons eligible for their vaccine generally. How have we been doing this or how are we embarking upon this? We're looking at now our community groups and in fact we have sent out um, an invitation to all community groups. All right, um, We've sent the invitation out to the community groups and we've invited them to submit listings of their members and related uh, members and families and so on. These community groups would include, by examples, religious organizations and interreligious ones, members of parliament, re regional corporations, chamber of commerce, the rotary clubs, non-government associations, 
farmers associations, hunters associations, market vendors associations, small groups, uh, food vendors, the works. So we've communicated with all of these and invited them uh, to submit their groups names and listings and we will contact them and bring them into our mass vaccination sites for example uh, to be vaccinated we've continued beyond that all right um as i said to, to focus on our shut-ins our district health visitors are able to um you know touch base with all the people uh, who are shut-ins and bring them in uh, for vaccines if they can or as shut-ins we visit and do the vaccines on online there also uh, we are looking at our individual persons in the community we are sending out pamphlets to all to, through TT post to every post box in our community we are inviting people to uh, register for their vaccines we're giving them the names the, of their health centers and of course their telephone numbers so that they can call as you see on the the slide there the they can call the health centers and make their appointments also on that pamphlet uh, to combat any type of hesitancy we have on the back of the pamphlet on the reverse side some questions and answers about our vaccines so that as I said all of these will hit the mailboxes they will also be available at supermarkets and that you know we also sending them out as media inserts so that the population is really and truly aware of what they can access also our health centers are now going out to churches mosques mandirs uh, and so on and getting our people um, vaccinated at those facilities we've had the the cooperation of the church leaders and so on and so we are getting out there into the trenches um, to vaccinate all of those people the idea behind this this thrust of going on the ground into the community is similar to the model where we do a parallel type of system we want to ensure that we declutter we don't overcrowd our health centers and uh, so that we, we are going into the community and taking the vaccine into the community as against bringing everybody into the health centers where we will have massive crowding and overcrowding and that type we, we want to avoid that so that in this model we are keeping our health centers uncluttered we are going out into on the ground to the community Again, also, we will be reducing, apart from reducing crowding, we will be reducing uh, the inconvenience sometimes that the community faces of having to travel to the health center. All right, so we're reducing the reliance on transportation to the facilities and encouraging people to come more uh, to, you know, ad additional areas where we will, like the churches and so on, where we can uh, get to them and provide vaccines where we can answer questions and so on so our community outreach program continues and we are trying to reach as many as possible of the people in the community to try to bring the erha to herd immunity let me just also point out we have a virtual meeting as an example also of what we're doing one in nariva mayaro and one in st andrews in david where we are virtually meeting all the community leaders within our, our area and uh, the, the reason for that is to encourage the community leaders to participate with us in building the listings of people that we require uh, to come and be vaccinated and so on so again they will also be able to understand the, the kind of advantage of the vaccinations and so on and they'll be able to communicate that and get um, more robust listings of people from the communities we are also looking um, at our staff and family vaccination there's a national staff and family vaccination day on friday the 30th at the civic center in sangre grande and we're having large numbers of staff bringing in their families also 
uh, to the mass vaccination site at the Civic Center and at the Mayaro Sports Facility for vaccination. So all in all, we are really practicing an on-the-ground, community-based kind of approach to getting um, our, our people vaccinated. We continue to support uh, the national strategy of vaccinate TNT, and we continue to encourage both our staff as well as the community to get vaccinated. We just want to remind all that even when you are vaccinated, there's still a level of risk that you need to, to deal with. And therefore, we encourage all to continue with the three W's, which is wash your hands, all right, watch your distance, and, of course, wear your mask. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Mr. Sarifat. We will now hear from the Honorable Minister of Health, Terence Dial Singh. Minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to Dr. Richards, Principal Medical Officer of Institutions. Good morning to Mr. Ronald Soyafat, and thank you for the excellent on-the-ground work you are doing in your RHE. Um, before I begin, I would like to start by again thanking all healthcare workers across Trinidad and Tobago for the wonderful work you have been doing from the community level, the health centers, the hospitals, the a and um, It is really a blessing to be associated with such professionalism and dedication. I will also like to thank all those in the private sector who have been working with us, the volunteers. I just want to um, illustrate this national service with one example of an individual. Because it's, it's, it's important for the public to know the lengths to which people are going to keep us safe. I was at the Supermarket Association Mass Park site on Sunday. And as you know, we have trained pharmacists to deliver the jobs. I met one pharmacist there who owns a pharmacy. And he decided he is going to close his pharmacy on that Sunday and lose business so that he could take part as a volunteer in vaccinating people. And that type of volunteerism and philanthropic effort is something that we should appreciate. So as exemplified by that pharmacist who closed his pharmacy, lost business and worked for free. He not only worked for free, he lost business, he lost income for a day to vaccinate people. I would like to express my condolences, one, to those three beautiful children who perished in that very unfortunate fire on Monday. Um, I join with the rest of the national community in mourning their loss. Um, I would also like to recognize the passing of two giants, Master Leroy Clark, Clark and also my good friend who I've known all my adult life, Imam Yaqub Ali. Um, Imam Yaqub Ali and I come from the same profession. He was the president of the pharmacy board um, way back when. I know him very well and have known him all my adult life. So my deepest condolences. I would like to bring the population up to date with where we are in the vaccination drive so the population could be informed. So could we have this slide, please? Right. So as we know, we had set our first goal to be achieved by July 31st of vaccinating 188,900 persons. That is represented by the horizontal purple line, which I call the West Indies color line. Um, so that was our first goal, depending on the supply of vaccines. The green line represents the ongoing first dose vaccination drive. So the total people vaccinated with one dose as of um, the close of play yesterday is 365,597. The aquamarine line, which is the, I won't say the more important line, but which um, gives us our first milestone we, are, we were supposed to reach 188,900 by July 31st, 
we are currently at 186,690. Um, so we have reached 98.8% of goal one. So it means in the next couple of days, we will meet our first target of 188,900. So I share this information with the national community, but the message is, this is not a victory. This is not the end of the line. Rather, this is our first part of the relay, if I could use a sporting term as we have the Olympics, where we are passing the baton now after we achieve our first goal, hopefully by the end of today, we will have to set new targets. Um, I hope the national community is paying attention to what is happening around the world um, with the Delta variant uh, affecting the unvaccinated. Um, so it is being called the pandemic of the unvaccinated. We will be continuing our efforts to inform the public, to give you all the information you want, and you will see as we reevaluate and the vaccination drive evolves, as you have heard CEO say how he is evolving in Eastern, we are going to be evolving the messaging from this weekend. We are going to be evolving the delivery of vaccines from next week. Um, I will hopefully make those announcements on Saturday. We just have some I's to cross and T's to, I's to dot and T's to cross. And we will be having a different method of delivering vaccines, complementing the mass vaccination sites, complementing the drive throughs complementing the health center, complementing the public-private partnership as we move forward. The simple message is that vaccines, which we have been taking, all of us, all of us as adults have taken vaccines in the past. As children, um, you had to take a series of vaccines to get into school, mumps, measles, rubella, Dr. Richards, you want to call out the list for me? Yellow fever, yeah. tetanus, um, whooping cough. Yeah. Deep, yeah. And even as adults, when you go into a hospital emergency room and you go with a cut in your foot or your hand handling rusty galvanized or a rusty nail punctures the sole of your feet, I don't think anyone refuses a tetanus va vaccine. Right? So vaccines have always been a part of our life in saving lives. As I said, in a &E, no one ever refuses a tetanus vaccine. It can save your life if you get cut by rusty galvanized, or as we say in local parlance, a nail joke in your foot, right? As I think Dr. Richards could attest to that. So we continue um, to bring vaccines in Trinidad and Tobago, which are WH approved, WHO approved, which are safe and effective. And we continue to urge people to do your own research, do your own research from credible, reliable sources and make the informed choice to get vaccinated. Thank you very much, Al, and back over to you. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you very much for that vaccination update. As we move into the question and answer segment of this conference, we ask our media representatives to indicate their name and the media house that they represent before posing two brief questions. Kindly indicate also to which presenter each of your questions will be posed. And if time permits, we will field an additional question from each media representative. We will start our question and answer segment with Guardian Media. Good morning. Hi, morning everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media Limited. Okay, so both my questions this morning are for Minister Dial Singh. So firstly, we've been hearing a lot of chatter and rumors about fake immunization cards being in circulation or persons selling these cards. So my question to that is, is this something the Ministry of Health is aware of? Is this something they've picked up on and how could this be mitigated, if at all? And my second question deals with the outbreak that we're seeing going on in Tobago. Is there now a need for a more honed in approach 
to treating with that outbreak specific to Tobago. Thank you very much, um, Richard, for raising two important issues. So yes, there has been chatter about the sale of vaccination cards, which we have heard. Um, we take the chatter, as you put it, very seriously, because it may be more than rumor, it may be more than chatter. What we did when we got wind of that, we immediately um, revisited the way we distribute vaccination cards. So basically what we have been doing over the past week or two is administering vaccination cards on a morning to all sites in tandem with the number of vaccines. So if a site is getting, let's say, 100 vaccines a day, you get 100 cards per day. So that is one mitigation strategy. Then at the end of the day, when we reconcile vaccines administered, we reconcile with cards. So that's a mitigation strategy. On taking the rumor seriously, I can tell you that in visiting the Forgery Act, and I can tell you that some files are actually on the way to the police. We, we are taking this so seriously. They are actually on the way to the police based on whistleblower information. For those who may be encouraging this or doing this, I had legal pull the Forgery Act. Forgery Act, Chapter 1113, Section 5, 1. Any person who, with intent to defraud or deceive, forges any document whatsoever, having thereupon or affixed thereto the stamp or impression of the public seal of Trinidad and Tobago or the seal of the President, is liable to imprisonment for life. Section 5. Three, any person who, with intent to defraud or deceive, commits forgery of any of the following documents is liable to imprisonment for seven years. And when you go to 5.3i, any certificate, declaration, or order under any written law relating to, and pay attention to this one now, relating to vaccination or to the registration of births and deaths, you commit an offense. So a couple files brought forward with information from a very concerned whistleblower are actually on the way to the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service for their action. And if proved to be valid, those persons will go before the courts and be imprisoned for seven years. We are taking this seriously. Very, and it doesn't matter. Both persons, as I might ad advised, the person who sells the card and the person who receives the card are liable to be imprisoned for seven years. So thank you very much for raising that issue. This is what we have done to mitigate. And this is the law. And in closing, a couple of files will be on the way to the TTPS. I hand you over to Dr. Richards to handle the Tobago issue. Good morning, Richard. Thank you very much for your question. I have to confirm that we have seen a slight increase in the hospital occupancy over the last week in Tobago, um, and um, we did notice an increased number of cases. The Ministry of Health continues to collaborate with the THA and the TRHA to provide information and to assist in reducing the number of cases. And we have a team that's working out of the office of the CMO working alongside the TRHA. For further information on the actual number of cases and the mitigation measures, I would direct you to the THA. Thank you. And thank you for your question, Rashad. Uh, we now go to, to the, off, across the Tobago, Radio Tambrin. We are ready for your questions. Hi, good morning. Clayton Clark from Radio Tambrin. Uh, first question and a follow-up to the whole concern about Tobago. Uh, Dr. Richards, uh, you mentioned the collaboration with the THA. Is there a need now for testing of samples to now be done in Tobago rather than samples be sent to Trinidad to be tested? And is there a need for more testing on the whole? First question, or uh, my second question. Today, July 28th, is World Hepatitis Day. Uh, has there been any impact on the fight against hepatitis in Trinidad and Tobago with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic? 
and the focus of the fight against that virus. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Richards, we can feel the question. Thank you. Okay, good morning. Thank you very much. The short answer, and I'd like to confirm that there is testing capacity in Tobago, and that is in place through the TREG. Um, secondly, the question regarding the hepat world hepatitis day, the Ministry of Health continues to observe all events in the traditional healthcare system through our health education and health promotion department. We need to understand and appreciate that in the traditional healthcare system, we are looking at the presence of comorbidities, and of course, hepatitis would be considered a comorbidity um, and a coexisting medical condition that can worsen the prognosis of a COVID-19 patient. So in the short answer, um, we are continuing with all our health education programs, um, you know, for example, National Blood Transfusion Day and the Hepatitis Day with our specialists. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Richards. We now go to I-95.5. I yes, good morning to everyone with Field Tuner I-95.5. Um, Dr. Richards, you had an audio dropout in your last response, so perhaps you might need to repeat that. Um, Minister Dial Singh, I think my two questions would be for you, but um, to follow up on Richard's question, um, in as it pertains to the outbreak at the Scarborough port. Um, we reached out to officials on, at the port and they referred us to the ministry. So I don't know if you can give us some details on the outbreak there. And for my second question, if you will permit me to walk Shakespearean for a minute, to mix or not to mix, that's the question as it pertains to vaccines and the different types of vaccines. Can they be mixed? How should they be mixed? The order in which they should be mixed. Can you give us some details there, please? Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very, very much. So on the issue of outbreaks in Tobago and the Tobago court, I, I would respectfully suggest you raise that with the officials in Tobago, either the judiciary in Tobago, the TRHA, um, so they can give you more on the ground information. On the issue of vaccine mixing, yes, this is a topical issue. And I would like to repeat what the Chief Medical Officer has already articulated as government policy by reading a press release of June 15, 2001. WHO has updated its recommendations re-interchangeability of vaccines with specific reference to Pfizer. The current recommendation is to use the same product for both doses. So if you got AZ first, or Pfizer first, the recommendation is as far as possible to use the same one for your second dose. However, preliminary studies from a mixed vaccine schedule with Pfizer as the second dose following a first dose of AstraZeneca show a slightly increased but acceptable reactogenicity. And let me explain what that means. Reactogenicity means the side effect profile because you don't want to be mixing vaccines without authorization that people have more side effects. So that is one major reason why we have to be careful in following the bandwagon on mixing vaccines without evidence. So it shows a slightly increased meaning a slight increase in side effects, but it is acceptable. So a slightly increased, but acceptable react, how you react to it, reactogenicity, with superior or similar immunogenicity results. So similar or slightly elevated side effects, but with similar or better immune response. Thus, this supports the use of Pfizer as a second dose where AstraZeneca vaccine is not available due to vaccine supply constraints or other concerns. So basically what they are saying, if you had AZ first and for some reason AZ is not available or you had a bad reaction to AZ, it is okay to take 
Pfizer as a second shot and then wait your two weeks as usual to be considered fully vaccinated. This is the current position that we are that we are adhering to. We have been consistent with this over the past few weeks when this uh, first uh, came up in the public domain. But as usual, as this COVID response evolves, as more and more information comes about mixing of vaccines to produce similar results, better results, we will advise the population um, via having the data looked at by CAFA, the local technical advisory group, and advise the population. So short answer for now, first dose AstraZeneca, second dose Pfizer, wait two weeks, you are considered fully vaccinated. Thank you very much for that question, sir. Thank you very much. And now we go to IETV. Good morning. Hi, good morning, Bina Mahes, IETV News. I have two short questions. Um, my first question would perhaps go to the minister or Dr. Richards. We have um, received reports some, from some stakeholders recently that they are observing a bit of vaccine hesitancy to persons who were scheduled to come out for their um, shots during some mass drives. Can you confirm whether hesitancy is indeed setting in once more? And my second question for Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, earlier on you mentioned that there is an increase in more severe cases, more persons are coming in um, sicker or more sick than usual. Do you have any idea what is causing this? Um, is testing for the, in the Delta variant um, begun? Has, has it begun as yet? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. I'll take the first one and then we go to Dr. Richards for the second one. Yeah, so let's, let's address the issue of vaccine hesitancy. Vaccine hesitancy is a very broad term which is used to encompass a lot of feelings, attitudes, um, beliefs about vaccines in general. If you start to look at these studies and break it down, some people may not be vaccine hesitant in the true meaning of the word. You know what they may be afraid of? Needles. <laughs> so needles. It's not that they don't want to be vaccinated. They may be afraid of needles. So that is something we have to do. Then Dr. Richards, and I will ask her to explain this in some more detail. There are some people who suffer from what is called white coat syndrome. The minute they see a doctor, their blood pressure goes up. <laughs> Right? So, Dr. Richards, you will spend a little time talking about that. They just don't like medical procedures. It's not that they are hesitant about vaccines or don't want to be vaccinated. Then you have those who get their information from social media and who read the bad news. And human nature will tell you, we tend to retain bad news more than good news. Right? And then people are looking for convenience and confidence. At the end of the day, all these studies will tell you that you can't use any one mass message to address all of these things. That is why we started two weeks ago with religious leaders talking about vaccinating, using peers, using influencers. This week, moving forward from this weekend, you are going to see an evolution of the communication strategy using more social media influencers, using more radio to address all of these individual concerns because it is difficult to craft one message in a newspaper on TV that addresses all of these concerns. And that is part of what uh, Mr. Soyafat is doing in ERHA. You meet with the with the leaders and address their concerns. One of the concerns that we have, and I'm glad you raised this, to show you how people have thoughts that you and I may find difficult to understand, but in their mind, it is real. One person in a focus group, when we asked, why are you not getting vaccinated? You know what his response was? He doesn't believe in politics. Now, <laughs> How do you deal with that? 
because the issue of vaccination has become politicized in certain parts of the world. So he is telling us in a focus group, he doesn't believe in politics. So we are addressing this in, a, in various methods of communication, backed up by local distribution of vaccines, as uh, CEO said. And um, so just to recap, vaccine hesitancy does not necessarily mean the person doesn't trust vaccines. As I said, it may be a fear of needles. Dr. Richards will talk about white coat syndrome. Um, they want more convenience. Um, so we are starting to provide transport and so on, right? So what we have to look at now is getting people confident in the program, making sure people are not complacent, and urging people that we have a collective responsibility to be vaccinated. So for example, if there's a pregnant person in a household, she cannot be vaccinated. But everybody else in that household, her partner, her parents, her siblings, they have a collective responsibility to be vaccinated, to get that little herd immunity in that household, so that pregnant woman who can't be vaccinated is protected. Okay, Bina, thank you for that excellent question. I hope I answered it. And over to Dr. Richards. Okay, good morning, Bina. Uh, you have a three-part question that I'll respond to. So let's start speaking about white coat um, hypertension and white coat syndrome. This is a well-established psychological um, symptomatic um, condition that we all notice in medicine. And it's really when, put simply, when a person approaches a physician or thinks about a physician and they, their blood pressure goes up, they demonstrate temporary, very temporary symptoms of anxiety that would result, for example, in an increased heart rate. Um, sometimes they are a little bit breathless, an increased breathing rate and an increased high blood, um, they may have an increased blood pressure or hypertension. Now, how do we mitigate against white coat syndrome? We really start speaking to persons and counseling them. And this is one of the reasons that the Ministry of Health, alongside the private sector, in terms of our partnership, continues to provide health education sessions to persons. We continue to go to workplaces so that persons' fears would be reduced. And we try to make all our vaccination sites very efficient and comfortable. Your second question was around testing for variants. And the Ministry of Health continues to partner with the University of the West Indies. You would have noted and the media would have noted that Dr. Christine Carrington appears at our media conferences for updates. And we do have an approach and a protocol for detecting variants of concern. So for example, all persons who are returning nationals or repatriates that are positive, they are isolated in a parallel healthcare facility because of the high risk of potential variant spread. Um, that is if there's a variant possible. And the sample is again tested at the UE lab for genotype and sequencing. We also look at persons who may have had reinfection or persons who would have been positive contacts of recent international travelers. Um, the last part of your question dealt with the clinical severity or to put simply how sick our patients are. And yes, we have noticed high occupancy rates in the ICU. The average ICU occupancy rate from July, from June 1st to present is 82%, which is pretty high. And the HDU occupancy rate, which tends to fluctuate, is actually at 67%. And that's the average between July, June 1st and now. Now, there are several factors that would contribute to these high levels of ICU and HDU patients. Firstly, if persons present late, and in many cases, we notice that even though persons may have had symptoms, they contact the ambulance services when they are in severe respiratory distress. That is when they start having high fevers, when they are having problems breathing. Of course, the later you present means that there is a greater chance that you would end up with serious complications. Secondly, of course, persons with coexisting medical conditions, the elderly, the obese, of course, they are at greater risk of developing complications. Thirdly, we look at the actual uh, pathophysiology of the variant that we have. And Dr. Hines and Dr. Carrington have repeatedly um, stated that the Brazilian variant, which of course has a high infectivity rate, 
um, under high R naught or the, the rate at which it spreads is um, present and is well established in our population. So I hope that this explanation summarizes um, the three questions and concerns that you would have had. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister and Dr. Richards. We now go to AZP News. Good morning. Good morning, Priya Bihari, azpnews.com. Um, Minister, I, I want to talk again about the mixing of vaccine. Um, an individual contacted AZP News. She got her first AstraZeneca shot and she has had some some severe reactions. She's due to get a second shot on Friday, but but her doctor is advising her against the second shot. So she wants to know what can can be done. She is even willing to take the the, the Sinopharm vaccine, but the option of mixing a vaccine in the travel pass form that that individuals have to follow to enter Trinidad and Tobago. There is no form. There is no options for the mixing if you 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 take um, two two different doses of the vaccine. So I don't know if you can use. Um, your good office to deal with that situation too. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Priya. So I will take the second question, um, which is a non-technical question, and Dr. Richards will take the first one about mixing. Yeah. Okay. So um, the issue of body forms, I will certainly bring it to the attention of the authorities who manage the website and see if we could assist with that. Thank you very much for raising the issue. Sorry, I will take the second part of the question, which was a concern about the mixing of vaccine. Now, the Honorable Minister went into great detail about the WHO recommendations regarding the mixing of vaccines and the reasons why these recommendations would have been put forth. A major reason being reactogenicity um, of the vaccines that would have been mixed. At present, the WHO recommendations for the mixing of vaccines does not include the mixing of the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Sinopharm vaccine. And now in Trinidad and Tobago, we are guided by science. We believe in safety over expediency, and we continue to follow and to strictly comply with the WHO recommendations. As such, that combination that you are speaking of in terms of an AZ and a Sinopharm um, is not recommended at all and will not be administered at any one of our sites. Um, in terms of assisting that person, um, we would recommend that they contact the 800-WELL or 877-WELL number um, to indicate the challenge that they would have had and they can be assessed by the primary care physicians that are attached to that particular site. Um, they also when um, when providing this information would require a referral letter or a letter explaining what the adverse event was um, because of course at the ministry of health we do strict surveillance in terms of adverse events and side effects and we are asking that the physician or the private physician or attending physician provides some sort of referral letter to our physicians indicating the adverse events and the reasons why the mixing of the AstraZeneca or the, or, or the, the, the um, discontinuance of the AstraZeneca vaccine was requested. Um, these are steps that the Ministry of Health takes to ensure the safety of all persons receiving the vaccine. So thank you very much for that question. And um, you know, the Ministry of Health awaits uh, the response from that patient. Thank you, Dr. Richards. Power 102, we are ready for your questions. Good morning, Sparkle McIntosh, Power 102 Digital. My first question is for Minister Dial Singh. Um, can the ministry indicate the number of teachers or the percentage of teachers who have been vaccinated thus far? And my second question is for Dr. Richards. On the topic of the Delta variant arriving in TNT, I previously inquired about vulnerable uh, vulnerabilities in COVID-19 protocols at our primary port of entry. Now, Dr. Hines stated that the 72-hour PCR test requirement was a significant element in the measures put in place to deal with detection of the virus. However, virologist Professor Christopher Ora, in a recent interview with Power 102 Digital, stated that there is a three to four day incubation period for the Delta variant which means that the virus may not pick up at the time of testing, but it can present itself days after the individual's arrival in the country. My question is, with this information, uh, which I assume the ministry is already in receipt of, would the ministry be moving to amend travel protocols? 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Sparkle. I'll take the first question. The actual percentage of teachers vaccinated, I think that that accurate data may reside with the Ministry of Education. So I would suggest the question be posed to them. However, the Ministry of Health, in conjunction with the Ministry of Education, made doses available to vaccinate every single teacher because we regard them as valued stakeholders in society um, and we made doses available to them all right so i don't have the actual figure but what i do know when we had teachers we had two teachers days i think week before last wednesday and thursday um, the number of persons who we expected um, we had less than about a 50% turnout. Um, those were the facts. And um, we stand ready and able to vaccinate every single teacher, every single nurse, policeman, everybody. Because every sector of the society has to be safe from COVID-19. And especially with the advent of, we don't know when, of the Delta variant. The Delta variant may be here already. Just because we haven't detected it doesn't mean it's possibly not here. So we continue to provide the doses to every single sector. We are ready, willing, and able. And we just ask persons to do their own research from reputable sources, reputable websites, your own private physician, and make an informed choice. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we now go to... Oh, sorry, on the second part of the yes. question, um, which she asks about the variant and testing. We are always reviewing our protocols based on international best practice. So the issue that you raised with Dr. Aura is something that we are aware of. And we always review our protocols based on incoming and up-to-date information. So yes, our data, our positions are always constantly under review. Thank you very much, Sparkle. Thank you, Minister. We now go to the Express. Express. Good morning, Camille Hunt, Express. Minister, again, on the issue of vaccine mixing, there are several people who came in from Canada and they're saying they were given a first dose of the Pfizer vaccine and a second dose of Moderna, but they were not considered fully vaccinated by Trinidad standards and they still had to go into quarantine when they got here at their own expense. So they want to get some clarification on that particular vaccine mix that is recognized in Canada. And they're also asking for clearer guidelines to be placed on the ministry's website because they're saying there was nothing in the guidelines to let them know that that particular mix of vaccines would not be recognized in Trinidad as it is in Canada. Also, uh, my second question, one of the individuals, he is a stage four cancer patient. So his relatives are asking if he can be allowed to quarantine at home, because not only is it expensive to pay for the hotel, but the hotel is not equipped for his medical needs. So it's very challenging for them. And they would like to know what is the advice in a situation like that? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Camille. The mic was off there. So let me reiterate Trinidad Trinidad's and Tobago's position on vaccine mixing. And I think for clarity, I may have to reread the, um, the press release. As of June 15, 2021, WHO has updated its recommendations, re-interchangeability of vaccines. I will I'll just give you the highlights. Preliminary studies from a mix of vaccines scheduled with Pfizer as the second dose following a first dose of AstraZeneca. So that has been the position in Trinidad and Tobago. Every country is a sovereign state and can make their own recommendations, rules, and so on. We are following and adhering to the WHO guidelines and the current position as of now is that we recommend mixing of vaccines but only if the first dose is AstraZeneca and your second dose is Pfizer and you wait two weeks. 
On the other issue of exceptions, that is something that has to be dealt with clinically, but our policies are in place. If you are unvaccinated by Trinidad and Tobago standards, you have to quarantine for two weeks at your expense, as other countries have done for their own citizens. Canada, England, all other countries have done similar things, and in the Caribbean. Um, thank you very much, um, Camille, for the two questions. Thank you, Minister. We now go to TV6. Hi, good morning, everyone. Urvashi from TV6. Um, my first question is for Dr. Richards. Dr. Richards, also on Monday, um, Dr. Hines would have pointed to a 1%, then 6 then 8% increase in the number of cases in the past three weeks. Today, you would have also pointed to an 8% increase in positivity from 25 to 33%. Is this... Um, snowballing of sorts as previously talked about by the CMO and are you looking at it as the po as a possible entry of a variant of concern whether it be Delta or anything else um second question um maybe Dr Sawyer thanks um as it relates to hesitancy we're seeing that there's a high level of hesitancy or non-acceptance um by healthcare workers how are you addressing this very high risk category? Um, your own your own staff, your own nurses, doctors, and so on. How are you getting them and compelling them to take the vaccine? And at one point, at what point, Dr. Soifat, will you be considering door-to-door -door vaccinations? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Avashi. So your first question centered around the increasing positivity rate and also the increasing um, number of cases and the increasing rolling average that Dr. Hines would have demonstrated. Now, I just want to reiterate that an increasing rolling average would result in an increasing hospitalization with a lag probably of about five to seven days. So again, we should not be complacent about the consistent and steady decline over the last two weeks or so in the overall hospital occupancy. Now, of course, the Honorable Minister would have indicated that at this point in time, there have been no laboratory confirmed cases of the Delta variant, but of course, we are continue to do um, our partnership and surveillance with the University of the West Indies to do genotype sequencing to detect the variant in high risk populations. Now, yes, we believe that according to our current projections, that if we continue at this rate, there will be an increase in the number of cases that is, we are looking at a low 300s by the end of August. And Dr. Hines would have shared this information in great detail on Monday. In order to prevent or to reduce this increase in cases, we continue to ask members of the population to please um, accept the vaccine at any one of our 109 health centers, six mass vaccination sites, and six of the sites in partnership with the private sector. And I'll pass on to Mr. Soyafat to um, provide a response to the, the second question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Richards. Just, just let me point out that um, we're not, we're not looking to compel anybody to take the vaccine, but more to encourage. Um, the other thing is that um, we had varying levels of acceptance of the vaccine within the, uh, the staffing. As a matter of fact, in, in our clinical areas, we had about 85% uptake very early. Uh, we did have one or two areas where the uptake was lower than that. But we have been reaching out um, in terms of you know, uh, counseling, talking with people. Some of the concerns were, uh, I want my vaccine, but I also want to have my family vaccinated. And at one point in time, we were handling healthcare workers and the over 65 population and so on. That's not, no, that's not happening now. We're vaccinating everyone. And as a matter of fact, um, we have an uptake of about 400 plus persons for our Friday um, national campaign to vaccinate our staff so that the uptake is increasing and we continue to encourage our staff uh, to do their vaccinations. 
but um, I don't think it's 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 a general statement that we could make that there was low uptake. And um, as I said, we're not compelling; we're encouraging. Thank you very much, Mr. Soifat. Um, we close with the news day. Our final questions go to the news day. Good morning. Well, good afternoon to the panel. So my questions are for Minister Delsing. Um, I just want to go back to that vaccine mixing topic because I was asked this since last week. Um, and based on the answers that you've given so far, if someone who has the Pfizer Moderna mix um, comes into the country as and is perceived as unvaccinated by TNT, goes through the two week quarantine process, what happens to them afterwards? Are, do they now have to go and get two Sinopharm vaccines? Are they then recognized as vaccinated? Second question is, um, Dr. Tim Gopi Singh had suggested in a media conference last week that the COVID-19 team needs to seek help in managing the number of deaths in the ICUs and HDUs. Um, do you have a response to that? Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, so... <laughs> Uh, let, let's let's go through the issue of vaccine mixing again. So the only vaccine mixing to be considered to be fully vaccinated in Trinidad and Tobago as per our policy is first dose AstraZeneca um, followed by a uh, second dose Pfizer and two weeks. None, no other combination at this time that could change if other recommendations come out. No other combination at this time um, will qualify you to be fully vaccinated in Trinidad and Tobago to enter without being quarantined, right? Um, what happens afterwards if a person comes in with a mix to be considered quarantine? That person should consult with your private physician and get an opinion as to whether they can take other vaccines available in Trinidad and Tobago. That's a private decision, uh, a, a decision to be made between their physician and the patient. On the issue of Dr. Tim Gopi Singh, the less said about him, the better. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone. We have come to the end of today's virtual media conference. Remember the COVID-19 vaccines being distributed, distributed by the Ministry of Health are all WHO approved. They are safe, effective, and free. As we close, we invite you to view another in our series of Voices for Vaccination, uh, Mr. Trevor Khan, and that will be followed by a WHO a video that deals with vaccinations and the Delta variants. But before, we will go to the minister for closing remarks. Yeah, thank you. I just want to um, go back to Dr. Tim Gopi Singh. It was Dr. Tim Gopi Singh, and the reason why I said the less said about him, the better. When he was in government, no, when he was in opposition, he went to the prime minister to recommend hydroxychloroquine. And, you know, that's why... I would prefer if Dr. Gopi Singh would really believe in science because he also defended the statement about sunshine. He was recommended sunshine and hydroxychloroquine. Florida has the same sunshine that we have and they are in the midst of a delta upsurge. Trinidad and Tobago has the same sunshine we had last year. India has the same sunshine they had last year. So I, we are willing to listen to any constructive criticism. And Dr. Hines and Dr. And Dr. Parasram have been at pains to explain the case fatality ratio of Trinidad and Tobago versus global norms and averages. So um, I really urge all of us to be led by the science and to be led by the evidence. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you, Minister. We'll now go to the videos. But remember, for a healthy you and a healthy me, let's do all our part. Let's vaccinate TNT. On October 
December 27 last year, I tested positive for the COVID-19 virus. The classic symptoms came on suddenly and in quick succession, but the sustained public education campaign was enough for me to know that I needed to go get tested. I went to be screened and evaluated, and I was truly impressed by the professionalism of the hardworking doctors. They checked on me continuously during the process, and when they were comfortable, they sent me home to recover. After several weeks of battling the initial symptoms, my world seemed to be back to a state of normalcy. I felt better. However, several months later, I saw the onset of many strange new symptoms, shortness of breath, chest pains. Consultation with various specialists and after many tests revealed that I was now a victim of long COVID. The phenomenon of long COVID was just beginning to emerge and I realized that many people across the world like me who had relatively mild cases of COVID and who were fairly healthy were now dealing with a host of strange new symptoms. Thankfully, I recovered from long COVID. However, it did not take away the fear of my being reinfected. And it is that fear of being reinfected that influenced me to pursue getting vaccinated. I am aware that the vaccine is no silver bullet against reinfection, but I also do know that it does provide protection from severe illness, hospitalization, and death. I also learned that many patients who suffered with long COVID saw relief after being vaccinated. The info on the vaccine that I uncovered was enough for me to know that the vaccine is our best defense against the COVID-19 virus. On June 18th, I got my second job, so I am now fully vaccinated. I did this for my children, my family, my friends, and everyone who I come into contact with. I continue to try to convince others to do their research and consider being vaccinated. Remember, as kids, we were vaccinated, and as adults and as parents, we take our own children to be vaccinated. We put faith in the vaccine. So folks, this is not a time for rumors or fear. It's a time for facts. And the fact is that the vaccine is our protection against the COVID-19 virus. So let's use the facts, let's do our part, and let's vaccinate TNT. Thank you.